I'll follow all the way. That's a very important matter because I think it covers more than sometimes we think in that in those stated words. Where he leads, I'll follow. That's something that the apostles had to grasp that they didn't really realize what all that meant. And of course, Peter boasted, though they all forsake the I won't. And yet, we know what happened to him. Yet, when I come to my sermon this afternoon, the text of it is Philippians 4.13 then I think of where he leads I'll follow and then Paul said I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. When I affirm that where he Jesus Christ leads I will follow then this passage that Paul wrote says you can if you really want to. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now, I believe to understand the text we're going to have to understand the context in which it finds itself. Let me begin by saying, as you well know, most of the New Testament is written to people who are members of the church. The book of Acts covers people becoming members of the church, becoming Christians. But then the rest of it has to do that now that you're a Christian, here's how you remain faithful. It's not by accident that that takes up most of the last will and testament of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I think it's sad indeed that many, even in the church, especially in the church, have thought that, well, once I'm saved from my past and alien sins, alien sins mean the sins that separated me from God in the first place, and I'm baptized into Christ for the remission of sins that I've got it made. Well, most of the New Testament says you don't. It doesn't mean that God's grace isn't available to you now that you're in Christ because all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ, Ephesians 1, 3. But it does mean that we can sort of say, well, since I'm forgiven and in the church in the place of all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, God's my Father, Christ is my mediator, really, what's the big deal? But most of the New Testament says it's a very big deal. And how much is said in that part of the New Testament emphasizing a constant effort on our part to remind ourselves and one another in doing so of being faithful to God and all of the various things that are necessary to be faithful to God. So that is the remotest of contexts of Philippians 4.13. But to bring it down to the book itself, we find that he says in Philippians 1 and uh, verse 1 and then the latter part of verse 1, Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. You know, you could put that at the beginning of the New Testament. The New Testament of Jesus Christ. And then specifically the letter section, Stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So it's the case in all of Paul's writings to Christians that he gives great emphasis to being faithful to Christ at all costs. And we quote most of the time 1 Corinthians 15, 58 here. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain, that is pointless or worthless, in the Lord. So in this in closing his letter to the church, chapter 4 and verse 13 is found within the literary environment, that is our context, that's urging the church always under all circumstances and situations to remain faithful to Jesus Christ. John wrote, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. And that passage, Revelation 2.10, doesn't mean you live to be 95 years old, you go to sleep happy one night, and you wake up in heaven. It certainly covers it, but the idea of Revelation 2.10 is if you must give up your life rather than to be unfaithful, then you give up your life here in this body on earth and remain faithful, and you'll receive the crown of life, the crown of victory. So we understand 
the context of Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now notice that Paul's statement is personal. He writes, I can do. Can means I am able to engage in the act. I am able to do a certain thing or things. Whatever Paul is advocating at this point, we'll say, for the church in Philippi, he's letting them know that he personally is able to do it. For his letter revealed to them what serving Christ wrought upon him. We don't have time to go back through the letter, but just go through it sometime and see what he says concerning happened to him simply because he chose to be faithful to Christ. He wrote the letter then for the purpose of the church at Philippi remaining saved. It's not enough, and we need to know this, brethren. It's not enough to preach the gospel to the lost world. It's not enough for them to hear and for them to understand the gospel and to obey it. Is that important? Well, certainly it is. Do we, is that the end of our goals in proclam proclamating the gospel? Certainly it is. But Paul was determined for the Philippian brethren to fully understand that they must be faithful to Christ through all manner of trials and tribulations if heaven was to be their home. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. We just need to have it driven in our minds that if we're faithful as Paul was faithful, persecution naturally follows because you wear the name of Christ and do the things Christians do doesn't mean we're going to be fed to lions or burned at the stake. But it does mean that there may be things that we have to give up, things that we have to suffer from family and friends in order to be obedient to the Lord. Being faithful is being obedient to the Lord. Being persecuted because you're faithful is being persecuted because you won't give up obeying the Lord. Now, these brethren needed to know that Paul was a pattern for them to follow, that he was an example for them when it came to suffering for the cause of Christ. In Philippians 3.8, he had told them, and this gets me into a little bit of what I referred to a while ago as to what he gave up to be faithful. He says, Yea, doubtless, and I counter all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now watch it. And remember what we said in that song a while ago. Every one of us sang it if we were singing the song. Where he leads, I will follow. And then we said, I'll follow all the way. List of Paul. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Philippians 3.8. How important is the world to you? Remember, for those of you who were here, what we said about the word world and how much it encompasses. What did the apostle mean also? We see he says, I can do. When he said he could do all things through Christ. It's a personal thing. I can. And he's saying, you can do what I can do is really what he's saying. First of all, I want to say I like the can-do attitude. I think it's the military or some branch of it that talks about a can-do attitude. There's not a one of us, whether we're preachers or song leaders or whether we wait on the Lord's table or lead in prayer or something like that in service to God, whether it's teaching Bible classes, whatever it may be, that, that did it the first time. You remember the first time you ever did anything like that? I remember the first time I waited on the Lord's table. I was scared to death. All I had to do was come up there and take the emblems and pass them out. And I showed how to do that. But I was just a kid, probably, I don't know, 13 maybe, I don't know, somewhere along in there. But I can remember how frightened I was. I wasn't frightened of doing the actual act. It was just the first time. But there's a first time. There's always a first time. Remember the first time you took the Lord's Supper? I remember that. I remember it just felt funny after I'd been baptized. 
not because it was anything I hadn't seen done all my life, but it was the first time I did it. And the same thing's true when it comes to leading singing. You remember the first time you led singing? Uh, I know those of you speak and remember, Jeff, the first time you spoke. I even remember that. <laughs> but I sure remember the first time I did. And I was in a speech class. And I was wanting to be a preacher. So I decided that I, well, you know, speech class, I want to be a preacher. It's a secular school, so I still developed me a sermon as best I could. And you ought to try, uh, you ought to try preaching a sermon on the evils of dancing in a state school speech class. But I remember looking down because they wouldn't let us have anything but notes and cards, three by five cards. And we had to stand by, up before by nothing, nothing like this. And we had to keep in mind how we're supposed to stand and how we were to do and whatever. I remember looking down at my cards and my britches legs and just giving it this. I was shivering so much. Has to be a first time. Now, you think about that when it comes to Paul saying, I can do, I'm able to do all things. Well, now that's qualified, isn't it? He's not saying, I can because I'm a Christian and that alone be the best brain surgeon in the world. I don't know of a thing in the Bible that qualifies me to do brain surgery. And you can apply that to all sorts of other things. Well, then what does he mean when he says, I can do all things? Well, it's qualified. All things that's necessary for a child of God to remain faithful to the Lord. Paul says, I can do it, and you can too. That's the reason the letter was written. The letter wasn't written by Paul to Paul. The letter was written by Paul to this church. Now, I remind you about the church at Philippi and its relationship to the Lord, or to Paul. Paul thought highly of that church. We're introduced to them in their conversion. Remember back the Philippian jailer and so forth back there in Acts. We, um, we're mindful of the work that they did with him in supporting him when others didn't. They were very near and dear to him. Well, why would he be saying all these things to them about encouraging them to remain faithful? There will never be a time for the most faithful people not to be encouraged to be more faithful. If you've ever noticed the method of Paul, which was the method of Christ, they took somebody where they found them, whether it's weak or strong in the faith, and they carried them to higher positions of service to God. And that's just the way it works if you're going to grow and to develop in anything, but especially in spiritual matters. So I can do all things through Christ, but the all things is qualified because it has to do with things necessary for a Christian to remain faithful to the Lord. Well, that leads us again, and I hope nobody gets tired of it, to Colossians 3.17, because in effect, he's still talking about the same thing. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Yeah, it's pretty well parallel to it. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. In fact, it fits perfectly into this passage. That is, Colossians 3.17. So when Christians, now watch it, are in subjection to the authority of Christ, as that authority is revealed in the words of the New Testament, rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15, all things necessary for one to do to be saved are accomplished. All things necessary for one to do to be saved or accomplished. And I'll add this, to remain saved, that is, faithful to God in the church. No matter how hurtful and trying the situations and circumstances are, when one keeps oneself obedient to the Lord's will, he is always acceptable to the Lord. Hebrews 5, 9 makes it clear that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. This Bible has not changed in 2,000 years. If the world lasts 2,000 years in the future, it's going to mean then what it means now and what it meant 2,000 years ago. And at the judgment, it'll read and mean the same. James wrote this way in James 4 and verse 8, Draw near or nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Can you think of any way to do that other than whatsoever you do and word or indeed do all in the name of the Lord Jesus? Can you think of any 
way to do that other than I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But now I read verse 8 before verse 7. Verse 7 reads in James 4, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now you put those together, 7 and then 8. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Can you see doing either one of those without acting by the authority of Jesus Christ? And being obedient to him. I can do all things. Qualified. All things necessary to remaining saved as a Christian. We can add it this way. To becoming a Christian and then remaining saved. Remaining faithful as a child of God. So as believers in Jesus Christ. Who have repented of our sins. Acts 17.30. Confessed our faith in Christ to be the Son of God, Romans uh, chapter 10, verse 10. And we've been immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into Christ, for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38, Galatians 3.27. Then we can overcome whatever it is that Satan throws at us. Which he can only approach us through the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride or vainglory of life. He has no other avenues whereby to, to do that. So, no wonder Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, For we walk by faith and not by sight. But faith comes by hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So to walk by faith and not by sight is to walk as the word of God authorizes us to walk. Authorizes us to act. It's an obedient walk. And so we affirmed in the song a while ago that we'll follow Jesus all the way. Can you understand at all how you would follow him and not do what he said and the way he said it for the reason he said it? Not be obedient to him, in other words. So people are in Christ, those who are in Christ are people who are where Christ has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1.3. All of that has to do with my willingness from the heart to submit to His will. That's how I follow Jesus. You can't follow Him any other way. You cannot do all things through Christ which strengthens me except in submitting to Him. In Christ, we remain faithful to Him by always submitting to the authority that is His. That's why He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John chapter 14 and verse 6. So I also said to the apostles a few verses later, If you love me, American Standard Version says, Ye will keep my commandments. So this is how Christians are, are doing all things through Christ. You, you think of an avenue. Well, let's just think of the plumbing in your home. Specifically how you get water into your home. That water gets into your home through the proper plumbing. It wouldn't get there any other way. It flows through the plumbing designed to be able to get water into your house. Well, the same thing's true when it comes to that which strengthens us, which guides us. The power that God has located in Christ to save us comes through Jesus Christ. But Jesus Christ reaches us through His Word. So I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. It's through Christ. But it's through His Word. How do I know that? You wouldn't know a thing more about Christ if it wasn't for His Word. You would know a thing in the world about sin, salvation from sin, and the godly life, except through the words of the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So in general, how does Christ strengthen Christians? Well, we need to know that God will take care of us spiritually. 
He has the plan. Christ has overcome the sin problem. As far as what God can do to save man has been done. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. But then notice, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live righteously, soberly, and godly in this present world. It's in this present world, in the flesh, is where we're to live faithful. It's where we are to do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. It's where we are to act only on the authority of Jesus. And that's very important. So, He will not save us without our cooperation. Christians are kept by the power of God as they walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, 1 John 1, 7. I've mentioned this before, but I think Acts chapter 2, verse 42 is a commentary on the meaning of 1 John 1, 7 and vice versa. In Acts 2, 42, we find that the early church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and other things that are mentioned there. But I'm emphasizing the apostles' teaching. They're the ambassadors of the court of heaven. Through them, by the Holy Spirit, Christ speaks. That's how we got the New Testament of Christ. And that's why it's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And the idea in the present tense verbs is there. It keeps on cleansing. The blood that was applied to us to wash away our alien sins in the waters of baptism, is the blood that continues to cleanse us as we walk in the light as He is in the light. Now, can you conceive of anybody walking in the light as Christ is in the light, and yet that person is not continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? Or can you conceive of someone continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, but not walking in the light as Christ is in the light? Why to do one is to do the other? One is a divine commentary on the meaning of the other. So both verses serve to help us understand that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We can meet any obstacle to our salvation and overcome it by always being in submission to our Lord's will. That's the reason I say we can do it or He can do it for us if we cooperate with Him. Now the question is, do I cooperate with Christ? My cooperation is to believe in Him based upon adequate evidence and credible witnesses with such a belief that it leads me to submit to Him at all costs. That's how we do all things through Christ. To be faithful to Him in any and all circumstances and situations may very well in a given, as I say, situation, circumstances, cost us our earthly lives. But that's the cost the faithful are willing to pay. Because whether you live here 100 years or 50 years, however you die physically, the only place you're going to get your eternal reward is in glory. You will never have heaven on earth. What you're going to have on earth is what we have on earth right now. And it could get a lot worse. But what's going to sustain us? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Which means I submit to his authority even if it costs me my life here on earth. The foregoing is the case because our reward is not to be found here in the flesh. Let that sink in. You think among members of the church you would have to say that all the time. But again, the way we react to things in the flesh sometimes shows that we're not so much settled on the spirit. John wrote this, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Now let, look at this solid stand. But we know that. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But we know that when He, Christ, shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. 1 John 3, 2. Now let me ask you a question. Do you believe that? Well, faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And if we say, well, I don't know about that, then you don't have the faith that you ought to have. What does the New Testament teach about the specifics involved in being in Christ for Him to be able to strengthen us? There must be a way Christians can know they are faithful to Christ. And I know that because of this next verse I'm going to read to you. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith, 
Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you? Except ye be reprobates or disqualified, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Now, if he told us to do it, and what he said here is for our own good, we can do it. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. The Holy Spirit strengthens our inner man as we are obedient to the truth regarding Christian conduct. And that's set out in most of the New Testament. The specifics of it, the component parts of living the Christian life is set out in the New Testament. Paul wrote it this way in Ephesians 3.16 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, that's power, by his spirit in the inner man. That's a statement of fact. It does not tell you how he does it. But I know it's never going to happen if I'm disobedient to God because he's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, Hebrews 5.9. We're taught in Ephesians 6 verses 13 through 18 Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God. Now notice, wherefore take unto you. I've got to do that. God's not going to do it for me. I've got to put this into practice in my life. That ye may be able. Now what did he say up here? I can do all things. I'm able to do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And there he says to the church in Ephesus that ye may be able. When you take unto you the whole armor of God. To be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. I say again, if you read through all these letters written to individuals and Christians, you'll see he's saying, be faithful. Don't quit doing what the Bible says. It doesn't make any difference how young or old you are, male or female, what nationality or ethnicity you are, whether you're wealthy or poor, anywhere in between. The Bible doesn't change on those things. Stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Ephesians 6, 13 through 18. Now notice, this is something I must do. God's not going to do this for me. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. He tells me what it is. And really, if you go through each one of these, what we've been talking about prior to this verse is telling us that in our cooperation with Jesus, in doing what he says to be faithful, that's what we're doing, putting on the whole armor of God. Again, it is something we do ourselves. It involves the study of the Bible as one's necessary spiritual food, hungering and thirsting after righteousness, studying to show ourselves approved unto Him, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. It involves prayer. Pray without ceasing in all things, in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, making your request, uh, let your request be made known to God, James 5.16, 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 17. It involves scriptural worship, worshiping as God tells us. Notice, but the hour cometh that now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 23 through 24. It's godly living in all of its component parts. It's treating your brothers and sisters as they truly are, in fact, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And on and on we can go as to what is involved in godly living. It has to do with adding the Christian graces that are listed in 2 Peter 1, 1 through 11. Let me pause again. That is not done for us. It's something we do through study and understanding and submitting our lives to those things. Furthermore, practicing what Paul in general taught to Titus, the young preacher, in chapter 2 of that letter, verses 11 through 14. And I've alluded to it once before. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem unto us from all that he might redeem us from all iniquity. And purifying to himself a peculiar, and by their way there, that word peculiar is peculiar, or a purchased people purchased by the blood of Christ, 
a purchased people, zealous of good works. Am I zealous of good works as the Bible defines good works? Think of the things you know you have been zealous about. You just couldn't wait to get involved in it. Have you ever said, well, I couldn't wait to get back home and get this going? Or I couldn't wait to get involved in this. I just couldn't wait. You feel that way about the work of the church? If you don't, have you ever said, why don't I? Why don't I? What's there, what's there in my mind that says, I really don't care what goes on? Why do you have that? Where's that state of thinking down deep in our heart that says, that's not that important to me? Where does it come from? So we're back to 1 Corinthians 15, 58. That is being steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in work of the Lord. It involves contending for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints. And on and on you could go into the details. Which details we will not lower unless we spend a lot of time in the book divine because we want to know the mind of our Lord. I cannot conceive of a person saying I'm a Christian of Christ, wanting to wear that name, and showing a disinterest in learning the will of he who gave us that name. There aren't many of us on the earth when you consider the billions of people that walk this globe. When you look at those who believe in Christ as Savior, there still aren't many of them. But when you look at the Lord's church, Christians as they are defined and revealed in, on the pages of the New Testament, they're, they're just so few. So we have a lot to be concerned about. I want to end with what I started with. Following Jesus. Following all the way. That happens when we take the view that Paul had when he stated, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Make a difference in everything we do. It'll change your whole perspective of life. It'll make you wonder sometimes why people want to be members of the church and really not get that enthused about much of anything, but seemingly trying to get out of it. Uh, it's sad, but that's just the way life is. And all these years of preaching, that's what I've witnessed to, all too often. I remember one time back in Van Buren, Arkansas, I preached a sermon on the importance of giving and how it should be understood and we won't go into all the details of it but I pointed out that how many of us are willing to sacrifice just things of this world neither right or wrong within themselves in order to help finance the church better and there were two elderly men I actually will call their names I'm not going to do it they've been gone to their eternal reward a long time one of them came up to the other and I don't know whether they knew I was listening or else they knew I was listening they may have said it just so I could hear it one of them said you're going to go sell your boat and give money to the church and they both had a good laugh about it. Well, I've remembered it. And my feeble mind can remember it. I know somebody else in eternity that's going to that's gonna remember it. Nobody was saying you have to sell your boat or your lawnmower or your goat or anything else. But it's talking about a disposition of mind that says, I want to serve Christ with all I have and am, however little or much that may be. And I'm not going to let the Lord's church suffer and the cause of Christ be weakened because I'm anchored to anything in this world. Upon that premise, I staked my life and golden life a long, long time ago. And it's too late for me to go back on any of that now because it was founded on the truth. And I knew it was the truth then. I've known it was the truth all my life. And here in my elder years, I still know it's the truth because truth doesn't change. And that's true of anybody here. If you've obeyed the gospel and changed, you know what you did. You know why you did it. Has that changed? The Lord's uh, church and his organization, has that changed? It's, its work, has that changed? It's items of worship, has that changed? No, same word of God teaches it. And I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. If you're not a child of God, now it's time to become one. You're not assured of even getting home today. And if you're a child of God and wondered, where's your zeal? Where's the attitude of following Jesus all the way? If you need to repent of sins, we urge you to think about that and to do so if you need to. Pray God for forgiveness, having confessed Him. To do this now while we stand and sing.